Hi and welcome to a Coin Telegraph interview. My name is Joe Hall, a reporter for Europe. I'm here today with someone very special, Daniela Barbosa from the Hyperledger Foundation. Daniela, how are you today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for speaking with me today. Well, it's our pleasure. So the Hyper Hyperledger Foundation has been very busy recently. We actually recently spoke with Karen, from the, who's partnering with the Digital Dollar Project. What else is keeping you busy at the moment? Well, I think you know our core mission is really to continue growing our developer ecosystem. Um, we now have many projects, um, uh, you know, that really follow a lot of different use cases, um, and we've been busy building those communities. So, building an open source community is hard to do, um, and that's what the Hyperledger Foundation does. So, we gather uh, end user companies, we gather the builders and the developers, uh, the government agencies, anyone that is using blockchain and blockchain te enabled technologies uh, together to build uh, our, our code bases. Okay. And as I understand it, you are a WEF veteran, or a wef -teran, if I can say that, as you've been to several WEFs in the past, pre-COVID, now that everything's back being physical again. Um, how have you seen the WEF develop with regards to the blockchain and cryptocurrency industry um, over the past, what is it, five years now of WEFs that you've been to? No, so it's been two, uh, three years of WEFs, um, and then obviously last year there's no WEF. I've seen, you know, the thing I was talking to you about before is, this year, we're walking from one part of the promenade to another to go see different blockchain startups or different blockchain ecosystems where in the past everybody was kind of in a more central place. So my feet are suffering from it. The other thing is cool is that you know you have the big companies, the big banks, then the big uh, service uh, service integrators all like next to the big brands, the big blockchain brands. Yeah. And then last but not least, and I think everyone's saying about this, there's huge ads everywhere around Davos uh, with all the crypto brands which is pretty interesting it's like you've come a long way baby <laughs> great and so you first got into Bitcoin was it the mid 2010s how did that happen and you know how did you come across your first Bitcoin all right so I was living in San Francisco okay and I was in technology I was doing some work around digital identity specifically it was of my interest at the time um, and I was working for a big uh, Dow Jones a big financial services company okay. um, but I was very interested in what was happening in Bitcoin and you know and essentially it was just Bitcoin at the time mm -hmm. so I did go to a meetup once mm -hmm. um, and I walked in and I was you know older than everybody else and also female and I was like maybe this is not for me um, and I continued you know just following the market um, as long as I you know had the time to do so and then eventually I found you know um, Hyperledger so this was in 2016 was doing some interesting work mm -hmm. with the concepts the basic concepts of blockchain technology right yeah. of DLTs of why you want a distributed system System and why um, it, there's a lot of use cases in the enterprise to do so. And I said, I'm pretty interested in that. And that's how I joined the Hyperledger Foundation. Very good. So we can't talk about cryptocurrencies now, especially in Davos, without talking about CBDCs. Mm -hmm. I think you have a quite a positive outlook about these. Would you be able to share it with the, the, the viewers at home? Sure. So I think, you know, central bank digital currencies is a natural evolution of digital dollars and, you know, digital currencies. And the, the central banks are going to have to look at different options. And not all central banks are going to have the same approaches. Uh, we like to think that here at the Hyperledger Foundation, we're building a base of options for central banks to use from, uh, you know, Hyperledger Fabric to Hyperledger Besu, um, Hyperledger Eroja, and perhaps others that might come into the the Hyperledger Foundation as we continue to grow. One of the things that's important and we really are advocating whether we're talking to the central banks or other uh, organizations uh, in the space and even the private sector is that open source and building these things collaboratively in an open source environment, not just open source and hey, this is a piece of code, um, we'd like your comments on it, but hey, here's a piece of code, you could look at it, you can contribute to it, you could build upon it, is really important. And I think that's one of the initiatives that we're working working with the Digital Dollar Project and Finos, which is an organization, a sister organization at the Linux Foundation focused on FinTech open source, is really helping the central banks, the private sector, um, and also you know, down to the consumer understanding that the code is something that needs to be built collaboratively if we're going to be building 
currencies if we're going to be building new systems mm -hmm. um, for a global audience. Okay. Um, and last but not least, interoperability, right? Yeah. Because when you have choice, people are going to make different choices. Yeah. So how do we make sure that we can enable people to have choices and have an understanding of what they're doing there? Okay. So we shouldn't be scared? I don't think you should be scared. Okay. Um, I think that you know they in privacy preserving methods will need to be implied you know implied first. Um, I think that you know we need to continually to just educate um, and if yeah I don't, I'm not scared. I don't yeah. think I'm scared because yeah. they have options mm -hmm. and I think we're going to see many approaches over the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, there's already lots of uh, experimentation. There's some already in production. We're going to learn from those. Yeah. Some of the smaller company uh, countries um, have done implementations. The larger companies and the larger banks will learn from that and perhaps build even better. Right? Okay. Okay. And so there's a question I've been wanting to ask about the Hyperledger Foundation okay. and this idea of you know enterprise blockchain solutions. How does that differ from just a regular database, for example? I mean, that age-old question here, why do you need a blockchain for that? Well, let's start with the enterprise part of it, right? When we talk about enterprise blockchain, it's really enterprise grade, okay. right? So if you are a major bank or a pharmaceutical company or a big supply chain retailer, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that whatever technology you use is enterprise grade, yeah. right? Even if you're trying to implement a startup, a software service that a startup has, you're going to go through the processes of making sure that is enterprise grade. It's mm -hmm. secure. It has a commercial ecosystem around it mm -hmm. that if your vendor goes away, someone else can help support. So when we talk about enterprise blockchain, mm -hmm. that's specifically that. Right? It's enterprise grade, so government agencies can use uh, Hyperledger code bases and feel confident uh, around that. Um, so that's the first one. On the second, there are many situations that a blockchain is not ideal and they shouldn't be used. Mm -hmm. And we tell people that all the time, uh, less and less so. Because do you have any? Can I saw you? Do you have any funny ones there? Is there, you know, been someone putting boots on the blockchain, or I don't know. There's a club behind his clubs on the blockchain. Have you had any funny ones recently? Uh, not recently, because I think people are now educated as to what, when they, you want to use a distributed ledger, yeah. right? So when you want to use the distributed ledger is when you have multi-parties that are working together, mm -hmm. right? And what you don't want, you don't want to have to create another uh, middle layer, mm -hmm. right? That helps, you know, disintermediate all the, all the assets that are going around. Yeah. So when you're, when you're talking about blockchain and many blockchain use cases and maybe early 2016, 2017, it was really they were trying to get you guys, yeah. the media, to pay attention, <laughs> right? And you put blockchain on it and suddenly Coindesk or Cointelegraph and Coindesk and all is going <laughs> to go give you a call. Um, so I think we've come a, a long way from that mm -hmm. um, and there's use cases that it doesn't mean that you need a public blockchain per se, mm -hmm. you might have a permissioned uh, blockchain network and maybe there's five participants but the efficiency that you gather from those five participants and the ROI that you get from being able to work in that trust environment mm -hmm. um, is much greater than having to have a database that then needs to be reconciled all the time and that you have a third party to audit and make sure that it's done so I think there's a lot of you know confusion still around what is enterprise blockchain okay. think you know from an enterprise blockchain perspective it's enterprise grade it's mm -hmm. something that a government could build a CBD See, for example, on top of it, and not worry, yeah. um, but also that it is um, for different use cases. Okay. And is there a use case that personally you're looking forward to the implementation of, or maybe that excites you? Mm -hmm. Well, I think anything you know, primarily related with digital identity okay. and being able to travel cross con cross border, for example, yeah. right? All this morning, I've been trying to get all my passes and everything done oh, to yeah. go out. So, but digital identity and having control of your data, okay. um, and it's why I got involved yeah. in blockchain because I think it's a really important element of it. Okay. And Hyperledger Foundation, there's some great projects: Hyperledger Indy, Hyperledger Aries, that are working specifically on digital identity, okay. um, and these are being implemented in you know, some of the European um, uh, crit uh, credentialing systems yeah. um, like ID Union and EPSI um, and I think that's the future. So I'm really excited about what we've built here at the Hyperledger Foundation in the identity space sure. since 2017 because now these tools are actually really being implemented across pharmaceuticals, across manufacturing, across uh, finance, obviously. Fantastic. Daniel Barbosa from the Hyperledger Foundation. This has been a Cointelegraph interview. Thank you.